hello and welcome to what I hope is a awesome conversation with some people that um I truly appreciate for sharing their time uh, with us. This is a racial equity learning community event, RELC in Rockingham County. And um, this evening, we're going to be talking uh, with the generational panel. That's the term I came up with it for this uh, presentation about school desegregation. So there's everyone on this panel experienced in some way uh, when schools were desegregated. And they're going to share their personal perspective uh, with the understanding that there's a big picture that we're all familiar with. We just get to hear some subjective perspectives that I think will be highly valuable as we move forward. And we're going to capture that for posterity. I think it's critically important that we document things like this because times keep going and we lose certain things that we should. So I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to have seven people who are willing to spend time and uh, take make the effort to express what they experienced at a traumatic time, I'm certain, for some. So appreciate it. And uh, let's get started. Um, I think it would make sense for me to just go kind of left to right and um, get to the middle. And then you guys with that microphone kind of find your way that way. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, if you could, once I say your name, uh, beginning with Mayor Gorm, um, introduce yourself, tell us where you are, what you're doing right now, um, where you're from, and if you can, give us an idea of uh, how old you are. My name is Donald Gorm. I'm a lifelong resident of Reesville, North Carolina. I'm a retired educator. And I graduated Reesville High School in 1971. That makes me about 70 years old. My name is Loretta Boucher, and I was born and raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I too was a 1972. So, you know, I'm 70. <laughs> I'm Bob Winslow. Uh, from Greensboro, North Carolina. I grew up out um, side of the city limits of Greensboro, closer to Jamestown. So that's where I went to school when I was younger. Uh, I finished in 73 from Ragsdale High School, so that makes me 68. Um, and I've been an independent businessman for the last number of years in Greensboro. My name is Kenneth Moore. I grew up in Madison, North Carolina. I'm a 1975 graduate of Madison Med and High School. I'm probably the baby of the bunch. Uh, I'll, I'm 65, I'll be 66 next week. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave French, and I've been a resident of uh, Reedsville since uh, 82. I moved around a lot growing up and uh, went to school in Pittsburgh, New Orleans, Charlotte, Lenore, and uh, Durham, and so I've been a lot of different places, but I uh, graduated from high school in 76, so uh, as you all figure out, I'm 65. Hello, I am Denise White. <clears throat> I grew up in Reedsville, North Carolina. I have retired three times, first time from Fayetteville State University, the second time from North Carolina a t State University, and most recently from Forsyth Tech Community College as a professor of sociology. So three times is a charm. <laughs> I am a graduate of Reedsville Senior High, the first force integrated class of Reedsville Senior High. And we renamed the uh, mascot, the Rams. In 1969, when we met, they were black lions. And we came from Booker T as Bulldogs. They didn't want to be lions. They didn't want to be Bulldogs, and we didn't want to be lions. And so we renamed the mascot as Rams. I'm proud to be a Ram, but I love being a Bulldog. <clears throat> Thank you so much. My name is Lee Nijelski, and I was born and raised in Reedsville. Um, lived here until 10 years ago. I relocated to Chapel Hill but uh, still, uh, my heart is still in Rockingham County, and I graduated in 1975 from Reedsville High School. 
All right, Lee, you hold on to the mic. I'm going to start with you. Okay. Uh, and so they instituted something that I always thought of is that the it was essentially was voluntary desegregation. In other words, they essentially would go and recruit one black family, at least in in the school that I was in, to to attend that school, and they called that desegregation. And uh, just a I mean, obviously, it's, it was just as preposterous as it sounds, as I say. I mean, just uh, so that that was the, the the initial experience before what she correctly refers to as forced integration, when integration actually happened, uh, and that was fundamentally different. Uh, uh, that was actually bringing two groups together in a social situation that just had not had not been there before. So uh, much higher energy situation. So the, I started today's uh, presentation by asking for something that indicated your age. And it's primarily because I want it to also be understood. Or I want it to be understood at multiple levels that this didn't just happen like the snapping of the fingers and you guys experienced it at different age ranges and time ranges because just because Brown and Boyd, Brown versus Boyd of education was decided didn't mean that it was instantaneous. So a lot of this stuff took years and some point places it took up into the eighties. Um, so I'll come to Dr. White. Um, what do you recall before desegregation took place and after? Before desegregation, we were obviously segregated. We had one black high school, Booker T. Washington High School. You had no choice uh, to, but to go to that black high school if you were indeed black, born black. If you were born white, you had to go to Rizzo Senior High School because we only had two schools in our city, such as all of these other uh, panel members were from small towns. You didn't have a choice uh, but to go to the school uh, assigned to you. Um, I remember distinctly being in all black schools from the first grade through the 11th grade that none of my books, and you know when you get your books and you have the new books mail and open up the brand new book with the brand new pages, we never experienced that in the black high schools. Um, and I know it's something everybody can't relate to, but in every school I went to, I mean every class I went to in my school, there were four or five names already in the book which means those books had been put in the trash. We were using books that had been trashed by the white schools, and we had to put our name on the fourth line or the fifth line or the sixth line, and obviously it didn't have a new book smell. <laughs> Needless to say, our teachers were so kind and compassionate and sincere about what they did and in teaching their children that uh, looked like their own children, they were resourceful. And so even though they had books that had been trashed, they went out and found about, out about the new math or the new English or the way to, uh, the, way to new, the new teaching methods. Whatever it took to get us to where we needed to be to be successful, they did that. And because we lived in the same community, they knew our backstory. If you came to school without lunch, I never went a day without lunch. And lunch costs a whole quarter. I'm old, I'm 71. My mother didn't have the quarter for my lunch, but I never miss lunch, not a day. Did I know how it happened? To this day, I don't know who paid it. Probably Mr. Towns, my principal. But I didn't know how it happened. I just knew I went through the lunch line of everybody else. I wasn't set aside or um, treated any differently. We were poor. I tell people we were so poor we couldn't uh, uh, use all the letters. We were just poor. So really quickly, when you transition into uh, the desegregation pro process, give me a quick, you know, what was that experience like? Just it was traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And I told you when I got here today, I'm still traumatized mm -hmm. by it because it was my senior year. And we met uh, with Ms. Uh, Woods and Ms. Caldwell, one white teacher, one black teacher. Mm -hmm. There were six of us and six white students to decide how best to make it happen as smoothly and seamlessly as possible. And so we dictated, I mean dictated, that we wanted everything equal. And the population was not equal. It was 70% white and 30% black. But we dictated 
that like we could do something about it, like we had no choice. But we dictated that it had to be equal. We had five black cheerleaders, five white ones. Four, uh, whatever it was, it had to be equal. We had a black mascot, a major, I mean, drum major, and a white drum major. We dictated that it had to be equal for us to be not happy, but be able to comfortably come into a school that was not ours, that we didn't want to be into, and they didn't want us there. So, uh, if you could pass the microphone today, I want to say that again, I, I put the emphasis, emphasis on you guys' age and, and the level because you came into that situation as a near adult. <laughs> yes. you, you were at a certain age where you kind of knew what was at stake and what was at play. Mm -hmm. um, in your case, David, you were a little younger. Am I correct? But when, when I moved to Charlotte mm -hmm. in 69 from New Orleans to Charlotte, that was a cultural change. Mm -hmm but I experienced the beginning of busing as that came about from uh, the Port K Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. And so my starting sixth grade was an experience where I was going to a brand new school, pretty little guy, scared a little bit, but the fact that there was bomb threats, fire alarms being pulled, and pretty much everybody at the, skate, at, at the school was scared because of all the things that were going on in the media and the fact that uh, civil rights cases and causes had been going on for years and there was violence and bombing going on throughout the South. Uh, it was a scary time. And I think a lot of kids were traumatized, black and white. The kids that were bused in from Central Charlotte to the, the school I was going to, Quail Hollow, it wasn't a lot of kids, you know, it was a couple of school buses, but it was probably a pretty scary ride for them the first week. And so I just remember sixth and seventh grade being very scary and disruptive to everybody because it was a national focus on this case that forced busing to start. And uh, I don't I don't know if it was successful in the long term. I think in the short term, it was scary, disruptive, and painful for everybody involved, especially kids. Yeah. And I think it was probably disruptive to teachers and educators because you had schools that were closing. Mm -hmm. You had the loss of experienced teachers. And so I think when something gets settled at a national level rather than a local level, the results can be more painful because what you have to you know, you're being dictated to that you have to do these things and so there was a lot of tension and anxiety and anger i appreciate you sharing that so um again the, the emphasis for me on the the age ranges and the, and the times that were spanned um you just shared there was a lot more anxiety probably and less demand because you're just kind of thrown into the the washing machine so to speak whereas again uh, dr white is they're saying what they're going to settle for is not going to be to be less than in, the, in the, this great social experiment that's taking place. So um, I appreciate you guys both for sharing. Mayor Gorham, um, can you tell us what you uh, are able to remember from before and after desegregation? Well, prior to uh, desegregation, we were all in the all black school. And at the school, I do remember uh, there was one occasion where we got new books. We thought they were new books, but they were books with new colors. And once you turn the page, you can see fingerprints and drawings and writing, things of that nature. Uh, situation where we had to walk to school. We didn't have bus transportation. <clears throat> uh, but our community took care of us. There were always people who were driving trucks or cars. And we even had a bus line, a black bus line called Bass Transit, where we had two buses. Of course, you had to have 15 cents to ride the bus. So on those days when you had the 15 cents, you could ride the bus. And on occasion, the bus driver would allow you to drive, to ride free. So, but uh, when we went to uh, Reasonable High School uh, back in 69, I think the most helpful thing for us during that process was the fact that our teachers were there from Booker T. 
and our teachers didn't change. They treated everybody the same. I mean, I didn't see any difference in our treatment in the black school as I saw in the white school. And that made the transition a whole lot easier for us. And there were also white teachers who were in the same boat that made the transition from uh, desegregation to integration a whole lot better. Um, yeah, so I, I, again, appreciate you guys sharing this stuff. So one of the things that is often overlooked is uh what was lost and I, i'm going to get to that question but it's, it just comes up uh organically with some of these responses especially from uh black americans who endured this because there was a social structure in terms of education that that was firmly established and once that was disrupted a lot of people did lose their jobs as, as they mentioned uh, school administrators black principals black teachers so there was things that were lost and i know it's going to come up um, as you guys answer the question, but I'm, I'm going to get a little bit more uh, in depth with that coming up. Uh, Ms. Boucher, can you uh, recall what it was like before and what it was like after? Well, before being in an all black school setting, it was great elementary to junior high. And that's when we were forced to bus, be bus to Lindley Junior High. It was like my little small community in Terracotta, it was like about 20 of us and then they took the warren street area and took those kids and they had to walk to land but we were we had a bus 205 i never forget that bus number and we were forced to go to Lindley junior high and on the first day you know we didn't know what to expect because we hadn't really been around a lot of white people we didn't know what 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 it was going to be like but well, we drove up to that school and they were lined up, up the sidewalk. And it was like, oh, are we special? You know, or what? But when we got off the bus, it was like teachers, uh, parents, just standing there calling us names. You know, you really wanted to break and run back and say, you know, we don't want this, but we had to do it. It was not a pretty picture. We had no black teachers, no black staff. It was just entirely white. We were really afraid to walk the halls by ourselves because we were called names, we were spit at. We were even shoved, you know. So we learned to travel in pairs and it was scary. So I would go home and tell my grandma, I'm not going back to this school. And she would say, no, you're no different from anybody else. If you cut them, they bleed the same as you. So you just go and hold your head up. It was hard. It was hard because we endured fights. Like I said, shoved in the halls. If you were caught by yourself, you, uh. Yeah, we want, just... I want you to share that story when we get to that point because that's, that's going to be a personal experience mm -hmm. and I know you shared that story with me before but I, I do want you to um, share it out loud but yeah um did you have more you wanted to add okay. mm, and then high school got better mm -hmm. high school got better I attended Grimsley and it was more like a I mean <laughs> compared to Dudley I never got to attend Dudley I wanted to but I never got to attend Dudley High. but Grimsley High was more like a college campus and then they had integrated the teachers so you had you saw some familiar faces you saw some black teachers you know so that made it a little bit better so it got better in high school appreciate you sharing um yeah uh panther pride i did get the opportunity <laughs> to attend james b Dudley. um bob what's your what's your recollection of uh before the segregation and, and after what, what, what stood out and so um, I mentioned earlier that I went to school out near Jamestown, um, which was in the county. And back then, the city schools and the county schools were se separate school systems. And the dynamic in the city schools and the dynamic in the county schools was also very different. This, and the county schools even different one to the next based upon the area in which 
that school actually existed. There weren't in the county black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods that went to black schools and white schools because of neighborhoods and because of race. The, in the county and where I lived, black people and white people lived much more closely to each other. And in um, my next door neighbor growing up, my next door neighbors were a three generation black family tenant farmers on the property next door. Uh, they were the only family of black people in within walking distance of where I grew up, but they were right next door. And then you go down the road and there'd be another maybe a little enclave and, and, and so forth and so forth. But the point of that is we've lived in proximity to each other. And so as a little boy, I grew up knowing black people, the people that lived next to us, the grandparent generation and the parent generation would babysit us and the parent generation would do different things for my parents um employment types of, of things for my parents so i grew up um with these nice people next door and i would ask the question when i started going to school why aren't they in school with me well they go to different schools well why well, that's just the way it is. The answer was always, that's just the way it is. I never grew up with any kind of judgment around that. And so when integration happened in my school, for me, it was, it was kind of like, oh, fine, this, that's everybody's in the same school. It makes sense. From my perspective, it was a very normal thing to happen, moving from abnormal to normal. And that's really how it felt to me. It was experienced. Um, we never, in my <coughs> recollection, had any racial strife. I don't remember racial comments or, or, or name calling or any of that sort of thing. I don't remember any race-based fights. We had fights, but the fights were always amongst the less privileged white kids and not it wasn't it was never race related and in my school black kids quickly became part of national honor society student government homecoming court all of that sort of thing a very natural kind of way and so for me before was more abnormal and after was more normal but you've got to also put that in the context of the neighborhood the, the neighborhood where I grew up, which was largely rural or, or suburban to Greensboro um, and whatnot. Um, the thing that I didn't consider, and I think I, my, my perception was, my perception was with integration, well, good, black students, are now here, our schools are better. Why did I think our schools were better? Had to be because of what I had picked up and learned in, 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 my, in my daily living, or it could have been just perception. Obviously we're better schools or black people wouldn't want to come to our schools, thinking in terms of want, not in terms of force. Um, the thing I never thought about until much later was really what black people gave up in moving from their black schools to these integrated schools. Thank you for that. Uh, Reverend Moore, what was your experience like? As you've already mentioned, you were uh, younger. You and David, I think, are closer in age. So there's a dynamic at play there. And we, we didn't even mention the geography issue. My mother's experience was totally different from Bob's experience, um, not just because they're black and one's black and one's white, but because geographically speaking, the layout was different. The city versus the county was a little different. Um, so can you tell us what your experience was? Yeah, just as it, as it is today, there's a big difference between Reedsville and Madison, maybe, or Madison, where I grew up. Um, I never went to kindergarten. And um, with those black teachers at Charles Drew, uh, the black school, they knew me, they knew my parents. Um, 
Jesus. I actually started school when I was five. And you're supposed to be six. But Miss Rouse knew me, knew my family. And she says, you're going to start school this year. I was ecstatic because I'd never been to school. I'd never been to kindergarten, daycare, or anything like that. I never rode a bus. We walked while my mom dropped us off when I was first or second grade. I remember her dropping us off. So my first uh, five years was at Charles Drew. And it was, it was good because I know those teachers knew me. They cared about me. They disciplined you, and they all they had to do was say, I'm going to call your mom. Yeah, they, did. they didn't have to call her. All they had to do was say, I'm going to call <laughs> And And you straightened up that quick. Uh, when I went to the sixth grade is when I, I had to go to Scott School in Madison. I think it was still elementary, Scott Elementary. Actually, it was close to where I lived. And it was just always an uncomfortable thing. And it was like that until I graduated high school. Mainly because they disregarded Charles Drew. They took away the name. We had to figure out the name of the school. Like I said, I've been at Charles Drew. Now I'm at Scott Elementary. Uh, when I went back to the building that was Charles Drew for junior high school, it was Madison Mayor and Junior High. And for a lot of us in my era, we can understand why they took away the name. I had a brother who graduated the same year as uh, Mayor Gore. Um, I was sharing with Dr. White. I remember sitting in, in, in uh, junior high school and seeing my brother then walk out of class in 1968 when Dr. King was killed. And I was in the class wondering why my brother's walking down the street going to go to school. <laughs> Mama go get him. But later on, I found out what that was all about. But I felt the tension of integration throughout, throughout school for me. Junior high, um, thank God I was an athlete and I played ball in junior high and senior in senior high. And that gave us a little solace. But we fought. I fought in junior high school. The only time I ever been expelled was in ninth grade. When the kid called me, what he should have called me. And I got in a fight. Uh, but high school, we fought all the time. Every day. Every day. Black to white, we fought. Somebody was in the principal office every day. Because <laughs> we fight. You say the wrong thing, we fight. But then we we keep on doing what we, we did. But it was the tension was always there. Uh, and it was a lot because we never felt home at Madison Middle High School. Appreciate and, it. Yeah. No, no, I, I appreciate you yeah. sharing that. And if you have more, please, I'm sorry. I, mean, I think that continues for me when they closed Madison Bennett Senior High and built that Michael. We won two state championships at Madison Bennett. I had the state, I had the high school record of the high jump and the 100 yard dash. All of, the, all of our records, all of our trophies, the trophy case was done away with when they formed that Michael High School as if Mount Sumeria High School never existed. We had a running back who rushed up over 2,000 yards, Eddie Adams. All of that history was done away with. And I'm still bitter about it. Um, so yeah, you can keep it on that okay. side. But um, when you think community, I hear you guys elevating uh, the people that were the adults that kind of orchestrated or guided your experience. Um, I hear that primarily from uh, the black members of our panel. Um, and I also hear the hurt from not being fully recognized and, and assimilated as what, what was proposed or, or thought was taking place, and especially in terms of uh, what you just shared, Reverend Moore, uh, things that have been accomplished in the space that you guys value. Um, Leo, I, I wanna come to you. If you can recall, um, what feelings, uh, may have been present during this this transformative time uh excitement disappointment fear um were any of those feelings that you might have had validated once things uh happened yeah 
No, I, I, I'm sort of a, in a unique situation. I, you know, I introduced myself as someone who was born and raised in Reedsville, but I was born and raised in Reedsville by a mother and a father who had just moved to Reedsville from New York City. And they had a to not surprisingly a little different worldview. And with the name Najelski in <laughs> Rockingham County, you are as soon as somebody knows your name, you you are the other. You're not the other the way whites would treat blacks or blacks would treat whites in terms of making that visual distinction. But if you, if they heard the name Najelski, the, the old saying, you're not from around here, are you? And, um, and so I, I was sort of seeing it in this different lens than as, uh, you know, all my friends around me, I, I can more communicate to you what they were feeling than, than than myself and I always I mean it was a lot of bad things in terms of what I was taught in my household I was just appalled at what I would hear from my white friends and but I always sort of processed it as this is what they've been this is what they've been taught and it and it, it wasn't all you know it wasn't everybody but it was enough and, and you'd see, I mean, a significant number of my friends, they left, you know, they, they, you know, these, um, essentially segregation academies that all, they may have existed before. The one that was big out of Reedsville was Oak Ridge and parents just pulled their kids out and, and sent them somewhere else. And, um, uh, almost hundred, I actually, I think a hundred percent of them, the kids eventually convinced their parents to let them come back. And that's an interesting idea just in itself. If you think about it, that, that they asserted themselves to say, well, that may be what you want, but it's not what I want. And, um, uh, so yeah, I, if, I did not have feelings of, of fear or anxiety or that type of thing. I saw the, you talk about the fighting, there was fighting all over the place. Um, and, but I always felt like I was sort of just standing over here, looking at it like someone who was not, not in the middle of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Leah, I, I think, uh, you presented a, another layer here. Nuance matters, and where you came from was uh, uh, much like David from New Orleans. That's that's a lot of intermixing going on in, in New York and New Orleans, and there's not a prioritization of the separatism that um, persisted in the South. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate you uh, sharing that, and the, the nuance is is rampant in these, and when we unpack this stuff, um, I want to come to you, Doctor White. Uh, valuable time. Um, and I want to take take as much advantage of it as I can. Um, do you recall any other feelings? You expressed that you know you guys were somewhat defiant in saying you're going to set some terms as, or with this this uh, the way this thing works out. So do you recall the immediate moment of what was it? Was it excitement? Was it disappointment? Was it uh, no? We're going to do this our way. What, what was the immediate feeling that you recall? I think we, um, as a committee, there were six blacks and six whites. We were, I guess, kind of patting ourselves on the back, thinking we had accomplished something. Uh, unbeknownst to us, we didn't set any time limits on it. And Paul Gorham's class, the class of 71, went back to things as usual. It was a 70-30 population, and that's what they got, 70-30. And then they fought every day and walked out by 9 o'clock. We fought every day, every time the bell rang for the period to change. It was a fight in the commons every day, all day, all year. It's amazing we finished our senior year. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. <laughs> and so if we were dodging, you know, bombs and, and, you know, threats all around you. If you just looked at my shoes, that was a fight. 
It didn't have to be about anything because the tension was high from the time we got off that bus until three o'clock when the bell rang. You just had to look around to see where the fight was going to be. It was going to be a fight. You just didn't know where all day, every day. And so it was a tense time, but um, we got through it. Most of us made it through. Um, um, I don't remember anybody dying because of it, yeah. but it was not fun and happy times as it had been throughout our 11 years of school. We, we didn't miss school for anything. I remember going to school with the mumps. I never told anybody. <laughs> My mama said, you can't go to school with the mumps. And I slipped out the house and went to school. Most people slip out of school and go back. I slipped out the house with mumps to go to school because I was afraid I was going to miss something. It was just fun, happy times. And the teachers took good care of us. And um, when we got to integration, it was just totally different. And fear mm -hmm. reigned. Throughout every day, Dr. White, because I know mm -hmm. that your time is, is limited, can you? Uh, and I'm going to ask each of you this, so you can be thinking. She'll just set the bar. Um, can you give a quick story to something that you that you is your go to thought about that period of time, good, bad, or whatever it is? Just a quick story that you don't mind sharing. I mean, just something that that you know pops up, like, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I, I do remember that time. I think I thank uh, Mr. Uh, Griggs and Mrs. Woods for saving my life uh, because I was not in the commons every day. Um, I was a good student and I typed really well. And so Mrs. Woods typed all of Mr. Griggs' letters to the Department of Public Instruction. I'll never forget it. I typed all of Ms. Woods' stuff. And so Mr. Griggs didn't know that I was doing his letters going to the Department of Public Instruction. I needed English for my senior year to graduate. That's all I needed. They gave me, Mrs. Woods did my schedule. She gave me English and three study halls. And I spent three study halls in her class doing Mr. Griggs's work. Wow. And so they, I, I credit them with saving my life, but getting me out of my senior year. Because other than that, I would have been in one of those daily fights, mm -hmm. six a day, every day. Awesome. And I thank them for that. Awesome. That's that's wonderful. I um, want to ask uh, David. Um, same same question. Uh, did you do you recall any feelings of excitement or disappointment, or did did you have any of those? Well, you know, moving around a lot during my childhood and then going to a lot of different schools, you're always apprehensive. But Charlotte was stood out as the place where you just didn't know what was going to happen the next day because the fire alarms went off so often. And there'd be rumors that, oh, there was a bomb threat called into South Mecklenburg mm -hmm. and, you know, Quail Hollow, which was the school I was at. And so there was a lot of rumors. And sometimes the police would show up and it looked like people were searching rumors. And it was a bomb threat, maybe, or other times not. But there was a lack of information. I don't think we were told what was going on at the time. And so everybody was scared. And it was it was adults that created the fear and it was the system that didn't accommodate children's need for security and that was really unfortunate that, that kids were put through that because there wasn't thoughtfulness in how to implement this yeah. from a human standpoint and so that's i guess my feeling as an adult now looking back was what are we doing to the kids, you know? And that was a shame. Yeah, I think uh, something I often uh, wrestle with when I'm talking about uh, topics in regards to race is these established norms um, that largely take place from an adult perspective have to be disrupted at some point. And generally those that are uh, tasked with that disruption are younger and don't necessarily have the baggage or the residue or the things that it helped establish these norms and it, it is just a it's, it's a reason why i wanted to talk to you guys it's one of the main reasons so i'm, I'm grateful um if you don't mind uh reverend moore um do you have <laughs> yeah, either, either one do you do you have um any recollection of, of some feelings or excitement or joy or the, i don't know well, could you could you wait to go play some, some sports against uh <laughs> well, I'm just going to say this uh, after I said that, and we did fight. Um, because I'm, able to, uh, I'm fortunate enough to pastor near where I grew up in Stoneville, 
So I'm in Madison more now in the last um, 20 years than I was when I first got out of high school. And I see a lot of my classmates and those who were in school during the time I was there. And we have fond memories together. Some of the conversations I've had with some of them were uh, the white students, particularly, they were traumatized too, because <laughs> they were scared of us. <laughs> you know, they walk down the hall and we say something to them, and male or female, it didn't matter. You know, uh, females, black females was tough. And, uh, but when we look back now, we, we laugh at it. Nobody never brought a gun to school, nobody brought a knife. It would be just kids being mean. <laughs> um, um, I never really had, though, if there was something I could regret. Um, I never really had a mentor um, in high school. I was a decent, I was a decent student and a decent athlete too. But no one, I don't recall nobody just pulling my pulling you to the side and trying to guide you to what was next. I remember when I chose to go to Appalachian out of high school, I did so because a friend of mine who right there the year before me went. And at the time, Appalachian was trying to get black students because they had 10,000 students and only 200 blacks. And they weren't ready for us when we got there either. <laughs> Um, but it was it was challenging. It was challenging. So you know, I'm grateful I had a mom and dad, you know, in my life at the time, and a community that kind of helped us. That. That's my yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Tell, tell um any because because yours your experience was totally different. You were wondering what was wrong. <laughs> Why were your neighbors not going to school in the first place? So what is it? Was there any feeling of excitement or can't wait to spend time at school? With the people that live close to you yeah like i said earlier for me it was like well okay finally finally it's normal and and i was never you know the the the, the black people that started going to school with me that i didn't know i knew i, I mean i knew a good number of them actually um because uh, desegregation happened when i was in the seventh grade and it was um, a three-year school so seventh eighth and ninth grades so there were three ages of kids, many of whom I knew, um, and and not just because of of the family that was that lived ne lived next door, but the, the it was easy to be friends and 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 get to know each other better and and and, and all of that sort of thing. The people I was afraid of, like I said earlier, also were the um, really. Uh, less privileged white kids because they were the mean ones mm -hmm. and it was just I was just a kid and they're the mean kids so that that was much more troubling to me um one thing you mentioned nuance a second ago one of the things that's also I think important remember Jamestown that area is a very Quaker rich part of Guilford County mm -hmm. and so there was that tone of uh, in, in the world in which in which I grew up, south of where I grew up was a very very heavy clan uh, KKK area, and I grew up understanding those people to be bad people, no socializing with those people. In fact, there was a convenience store in that area where um, owned by class people and my father grew up with uh, some of these people and we stopped going we wouldn't my mother basically said we're not going to that store again but I would go when I was younger and would go into that store there I would hear racist stuff there I would hear racist terms and and all of that sort of thing in a very clear way and so again, that's for a conversation within within my family. And I'm not saying that my family wasn't um, racist. What I'm saying is that my experience with uh, negativity, like um, uh, fights and that kind of stuff, just was non-existent. And there wasn't overt. Um, there wasn't overt. I think in my world, racist language, racist actions would be considered impolite. 
And so even when people did racist things, or even when people would send their kids to private schools, they would send them for different reasons. It wouldn't be because of the school situation, though we know probably in some situations for sure it, 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 it was. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Boucher, hold on one second. I'm going to get a last word from Dr. White because I know she has to leave. And the last word from you is going to, again, is, I'm going to ask everyone to tell us a quick story in a moment. But um, the last word is what was gained and what was lost. <laughs> Let me start with what was lost. Traditions, uh, as uh, Reverend Moore alluded to, OT uh, was rich with history and championships, and we found all of our trophies in the trash. And so the traditions and the history and uh, um, all of what we brought in our talents and our skill sets um, were just ignored and just treated as trash, such as we were treated badly and poorly just because we happened to be going black. Uh, that's what all the fights were about. They were really weren't about anything of substance. It was really only about race. Um, I think bringing our black teachers with us was a credit, was, a, was a, an advantage that I understood Ms. Boucher did not have. Uh, we did bring our mentors with us. That was a blessing. We didn't know it then. We hated them at the time. <laughs> Yeah, Miss Woods, um, mm -hmm. love her to death now, but she, she was, you know, she was a godsend. But we had our teachers with us, um, so that helped us in the transition and helped us transition um, more smoothly than it would have been would have been had they not been there. Um, I am not exactly sure what we gained um, because we were so young. We don't know about the. Um, scores and test scores that they, they went up or they went down weren't privileged to that information um, and so I'm not sure what we gained but I think that as um, my compadre here said um, we didn't research they didn't the, adult, the adults did not research what the losses and the gains were going to be all they knew was that um, Brown versus the Board of Education said they had to integrate and they prolonged it as long as they could. And then in 1969, they made it happen. No forethought, no afterthought, just do it and, and let the chips fall where it may. And we were the chips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had the, the privilege of hearing a, um, and I can't recall her name, a uh, school teacher from that time frame. She was an older lady when they recorded this, uh, her speaking about school desegregation, and she said uh, passionately, they, they should have started with the teachers. Absolutely. How do, you, how do you do that to kids? How do you do that to young people? How do you make them bear the brunt of, of so much atrocious, despicable uh, behaviors and laws and things that you made them bear the brunt of, of confronting and, and overcoming when if you did it with the teachers first, you had adults in the space and in the room, and you would not have lost as many black administrators and black principals and black teachers as were lost. Um, tell, tell your um, your feelings of when you knew it was coming, you knew something was about to change, and then you could tell that, that story that you will never forget. Well, when we first uh, found out that we were going to be bused to a predominantly white school, the nerves kicked in, you know, we're not going to have our parents there, you know, because you had that family knit tightness and uh when we got there like we said it was all white it was just like about 25 30 of us there and it was like okay and they they lined us up off the bus and walked through a path and everybody was lined up on the sidewalk it was really you know like we were just like in the seventh grade that was nerve-wracking we were shaking we didn't know what to expect and they were calling us names, like I said, and the name calling was nothing that I had ever heard of. I mean, I'd never been called spook. You know, I'd never been called till go back to Africa. Africa, I'm not from Africa, you know. So it was, it was a traumatic, uh, scary time. No teachers, all your teachers are white, your principal's white, your coaches are white. And of course, like the, the guys, they were good in sports. Like they said, they took them under their wing. You know, they got treated halfway decent. 
because they were good in sports. They wanted them on their team. They wanted them to carry them winning. And I had cousins. I mean, he graduated from uh, Grimsley, and he's in their yearbook. He's first black out there with all those whites, but he made it. You know, he made it. And that made us feel good. That's, that's like, okay, but when they integrated the teachers, but some of the teachers didn't want to be there no more than we did. They didn't want to be there. They didn't want to teach us, <laughs> you know, like, okay, we got somebody here that's going to help us through. No, it wasn't like that. It was it was still heartbreaking because the teachers were, we don't want to be here. So, you know, y'all just like, we always think you sink or swing. You thought you had that one on, you know, you could go to the teacher and confide in them and say, well, we need a little extra help. No. Is there a story from your experience that, that you just, you know, you'll never forget? I'll never forget the first day getting off that bus. That's, that's, that's engraved right here when you see people lined up and you got to step off and they're just, you know, you got to walk between them. I never had that experience before. Never want any of my kids, I didn't want them to go through that. So is it better? Somewhat, yeah. It's a, it's a lot better from what I went through. You know, even like I said, doing high school, it's, it's a lot better. But that hurt is still there. Uh, Mayor Gorm, if you, if you um, I, I wanna, you know, make sure that we do elevate ideas around validation and, and being accepted through uh, what someone else was able to show about uh, people that look like you. So yes, we we do it societally to this day when it comes to athletes who become the the arbiters of our good feelings about being here on this 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 plane, this earthly plane, and this this country of America. Um, so yeah. If you can incorporate that, and I know you will be able to, can you speak somewhat also about the the distinctions that you can make, as my mother just observed, with certain people being accepted in a different way, and it might have been associated with the athletic prowess or something like that. But also about your experience, what were your feelings, and tell me that one story that, that you, you can't share. Well, I recall uh, School of Choice late 60s, were given the opportunity to go to a white school. And in the black family, the mother and father are the last word. But in this particular situation, uh, my father asked my brother and I if we would like to go into the white city. And when we told him, not at this time, I was more than happy that he went along with that situation because I myself wasn't prepared for that. Uh, and to this day, I, I thank him for giving us an opportunity to get ourselves ready for that transition. I think the most traumatic thing for me with the whole situation was the fact that I left a place where there was love. I left a place where I felt secure. I left a place where it was a transition from home to home because teachers were considered your mothers, your fathers. They cared about you. They wanted you to be successful. And they push you just like your parents would push you. I mean, it was, it was just like leaving home and go and going to home. And if I could sum it up with, with one word, it would be L O V E love. Now going into the integrated situation, it was traumatic because I know our teachers who transitioned with us were under stress, but they didn't show it to us. As I said earlier, they, I mean, they treated everybody the same. They treated everybody equal, the way it was supposed to be. Uh, 
It was those outside forces. Just a few kids, not a whole lot of them, but a few, enough to ignite things. And as Dr. White said, there were fights practically every day. So that was a pretty traumatic situation. The first year, it was 50-50. But the year that I was to graduate in 71, 69, I mean, 70-71 uh, school year, there were members of the white community who wanted it to go back to what it was, to that percentage. And uh, thing that I remember the most was the fact that uh, we fought it. And uh, we didn't get our way. It was 70-30. So in order to get our way, we decided we'd walk out. I was placed in a very bad situation with that because my dad told me, son, you're a senior. You've got the age. You can leave. But I had a brother that was a sophomore. He said, I'm not letting your brother walk. Are you going to leave me? So I had to make a decision myself whether or not I wanted to leave my baby brother in the building by himself. I decided to stay to protect my brother. Now we were rid ridiculed. There were uh, lists put up in the bathroom, uh, ends to stomp. And I was on the top of the list. But uh, we were blessed that nothing ever happened to either one of us. So any of the blacks who stayed in, because not everybody walked out. In reference to uh, sports, those guys who were the stars, they did get a little bit better treatment than, than we did. And uh, they were treated better by teachers and by, by students. It was like they were a part of the, the game when if you were not an athlete, you're kind of on the, on the outside. But uh, it was an experience that helped me to be the adult that I am today. I always try to take the bad and make it good. I'm thankful for you sharing that. And that, that had to be a true test of uh, everything you knew uh, to be that young and understanding of what was at stake if you um, what was potentially at stake if you left your brother yeah. to his own devices. So, uh, yeah, the, the nuance is rampant in this conversation. Um, I want to come to you, Ricky. I appreciate you um, getting here and, and making some time. So um, earlier, uh, the questions were centered around uh, your experience with desegregation. What did you remember before and after um, the things took place? Uh, and also give us an idea of your age, because one of the things we established during this conversation was not everybody experienced this at 16. There, there was 12, there was 17, and, you know. So um, if you can, just in a in a nutshell, uh, tell us what you experienced, um, what what class were you when, when this took place, and, and uh, what, what's something profound that stuck out, that stands out, that you, you know you'll never forget about that time. Okay. Um, I can remember it. Uh, our family were sharecroppers predominantly, and so we were like nomads. They moved around a lot, and transitioned to integration in the fourth grade. So that was a that was a big change because I started off in um, predominantly black schools, and I went to three elementary schools, like Reverend War here. I didn't go to kindergarten either, so I had no idea what kindergarten was. But I excelled because my family was close knit, particularly one of my older sisters. She made sure that I was on point when I got to school. And felt like family that everyone said when you got to school, because the teachers knew your family. And we had a pretty good sized family, and most people knew the graves in the neighborhoods. So, you know, if you got in trouble at school, it was home before you got home. Mm -hmm. Same thing in the neighborhood. Even if you didn't have a telephone, some kind of way they would find out. You know, something transpired and you shouldn't have been doing it. Um, when it first integrated, it didn't really transition that way because when we finally settled, our neighborhood was kind of mixed. 
So we had blacks on one side, predominantly where I was, and whites on the other side. And one of my best friends at that time was a white kid in the neighborhood. He had a motorbike and never seen that thing before. And so, you know, got to ride that. So we, we became friends. So when we went to uh, school to interact with someone who was calling me the opposite of what I didn't know what I was. And my parents told me, well, you're not that. Don't worry about the N-word. You're going to school. Somebody does something to you. You let the teacher know. But quickly, when you develop more friends, because you know when you didn't live in the same neighborhood and people um, lost their avenue school mm -hmm. where Mr. Gorn was, that was my first integrated school. The kids from that neighborhood became my friends. And they they said, "Well, Ricky, you might have to fight back because I wasn't taught to fight back in that manner." So, you know, I learned to fight back, and that dissolved a lot of the issues related to that problem. And I uh, also had black teachers there. So that helped with the transition as well and they encouraged me to do what I was going to school for as a transition to middle school, meet more folks, and then there were more blacks and whites there. And you didn't, I didn't run into a whole lot of issues Race-wise, I did have other issues, and this is going to seem kind of strange, more so with more of some of the Blacks because I was lighter. So, you know, you get into that issue of light skin versus dark skin and that kind of thing. And, you know, if you had a white friend, then you would consider to maybe be a traitor. You know, Uncle Tom, when you ran into those, so it was kind of like a mixed thing until when we got to middle school. Uh, I mean, to uh, junior high, we had junior high then, became more sports oriented. Uh, the kids who were smarter, uh, as they point out, athletes did get more attention, but if you were smart enough too, you got some attention. And so you got a little, a little more relief of that pressure from um, individuals trying to give you a hard time because you were directed to another group of people who were trying to go to college. and. I can remember trying to take a couple classes that weren't college bound and the guidance teacher in high school, Miss Jones at that time, she quickly redirected me to make sure that I was on the right track because my parents had said he's going to college. So I couldn't take that general um, biology because a particular teacher was teaching. So he was, he was a fine teacher back then, Mr. Bowler. Everybody knew Mr. Bowler. Mm -hmm. And so he made things very exciting, yeah. but I had to get out there and go to the CP classes. Um, got guidance from a couple of English teachers because I had to miss the prep test to decide which English class I would be in. So I started out in the lowest English class and they quickly recognized that um, I was supposed to be in a higher class. And so two teachers, one black, one white, make sure that I got put into correct classes. So I, I could see that um, I got guidance from not only just the black teachers, but the white teachers who saw that I had an opportunity. And so that, that was good. I, the one main thing I can remember occurring that stands out is that when the principal at the high school passed, the assistant principal was Mr. Thompson, who was black. He was overlooked, mm -hmm. and there was a walkout. Mm -hmm. And we all did a walkout on that. And that was the big deal, yeah, for back then. We did have some fighting, particularly in junior high. There were a couple guys, black and white on either side, that fought all the time. So we just thought it was always a race thing. So one day I asked uh, the black guy, he said, Why do you guys fight all the time? You know, you keep a lot of attention. He said, oh, we playing that. We don't want to be in school. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't even race related at all. He said, oh, man, when we out, we're friends. But we fight because we don't want to be in school. And our parents, when we get kicked out, you know, what else are they going to say? That sounds familiar. I, I, I'm aware of that tactic. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate all of that, Ricky. Um, so you guys kind of knew what was at stake, and you knew uh, there was uh, something wrong with the over looking of, of somebody who was clearly qualified for a position and you knew it was most likely about race. Um, you also uh, mentioned uh, colorism. 
there's so many layers to what we're discussing here and the individual perspectives, uh, they, they come together to make a better, um, to give a better understanding of the whole story. And that's important because your experience is not Bob's experience and his experience is not my mother's experience. Everybody's experience is different, but we know what exactly taking place as a whole. So I appreciate you guys sharing this time. Um, I'm going to come around really quickly. I'm going to ask for just a couple minutes because, again, I know some of you have got to go. So just really quickly with this question, all of you are going to get to answer it. What was gained and what was lost? And I'll begin with you, Ricky. What was gained and what, what was, was gained, lost? What um, was gained? Gained friendships uh, from different races. You know, back then, we didn't know a whole lot of people across the track. Because if you grew up on one side, you didn't know the other side as well. And um, also you gained opportunities that you wouldn't have before. Because I never experienced the high school level when this occurred. I didn't experience some of the things that Mr. Gorm and them had. My sisters them were in that era. So, you know, they knew that togetherness and stuff. So you, you, you developed, I guess, as the world changed, that was the good part about it. We, we gained that first own experience of how to work with other people. Uh, what was lost was that togetherness that we had. You, you had the families, you had um, the teachers that really cared about you. Uh, if, except for the third grade, I did have a teacher that seemed to want to give me a spanking every day. I don't know what that was about, but I was always well behaved, but I got it anyway. Um, but uh, you learn to uh, appreciate where you came from. You know, you, when you would go home, your, your mom was generally at home. Now, you know, you don't have that. You have all those latch keys or even kids who go home to uh, very hard situations. And growing up, I remember the love, as uh, Mr. Gorham again pointed out, love was really there when we had... Um, that part of the community. It was hard trying to make this transition. I can remember riding uh, the buses. Our bus was packed. I mean, it was packed when it was segregated. But when it became desegregated, it wasn't as packed as much. I just happened to think about that. I guess you could consider that was a good thing. Um, what was another thing that probably was lost was um, you know, you did lose some of your community because you no longer had that school that had that history. Even though we still have some history here with the Booker T. Washington um, Museum, but you still lost some of that history that followed you, that transition of inspiration, but you developed new ones. David, what was gained and what was lost? I guess what was gained was a sense that you have to be tough and self-reliant and, uh, you know, endure from a kid's standpoint. And I think what was lost was probably some innocence and trust that establishment is competent or adults tell you the truth. You, you, you lose the innocence in terms of not being com comfortable in, in systems. In other words, systems don't always work the way they are supposed to, and that there's gonna be people who are mistreated and the rules don't work the same for everybody. And you, you come to that realization when you're, you know, fifth or sixth grade probably, that the world's not a fair place and we can't trust the establishment to fix itself. And so I guess you just have to be self-reliant. And I, I think I, I, I decided, well, I need to be tough and I need to be self-reliant if I want to make the world a better place. It's sort of on me. You know, I can't, I can't be trusting that things are going to just be all right. And I think so that's a hard realization when you're growing up. And when you move around a lot, you don't have a sense of community because it's always sort of a new place, you know, trying to figure out how things work. But I guess the uh, being self-reliant and being extroverted and wanting to make friends and wanting to, you know, engage with people that wanted to go in a positive line. 
So I guess that was a positive thing. Yeah, I appreciate it. So yes, the, the, the social dynamics had to shift tremendously. And I, both of you kind of highlight the fact that you met new people, mm -hmm. um, good, bad, or indifferent, fight every day or not. There was some introduction and by uh, that occurring, a, a necessity of um, changing the way you socialize or, or the, creating a new variable in, in how you interact with uh, other people. Lee, um, tell us uh, what was gained, what was lost. Well, I'm, I really appreciate the number of uh, panel members who have mentioned what was lost with regard to, to Booker T. Washington. And I sort of have a, a, an odd uh, perspective on this. I have a weird um, hobby of um, reading obituaries. I, I just, I find them fascinating as you learn about people. And when you read obituaries from the black community in Reedsville, and if they're, they're old enough that they went to Booker T. Washington, it's going to be a significant part of the obituary. And frankly, if you were born white, and it might mention that you graduated from Reedsville High School, but you, uh, if you ever, if, if any of you ever wondered whether you uh, were sort of maybe not remembering that accurately, your fondness for Booker T. Washington, that you maybe were making it more than it was, I can tell you as somebody looking from the outside, it's something that I've always been very envious of because I never had that type of affinity for any, probably any institution, but certainly not a, uh, any of the public schools that I attended. Uh, so I, I appreciate that in terms of a loss. I, I, at the same time, I am, do ne have never doubted for a second that separate but equal is not a thing. It's that, you know, that's um, that, that your community came together and tried to overcome all the unequalness was, is, is, is laudable. It's a great thing. And, and it built community by you having to do that, but that shouldn't be. And, and it, um, So, you know, I, I hate that that community was fractured at the time. I think that the, the, the kind of comments we've heard here, you can tell that you've, you've sustained a lot of that community, even with, with integration taking place. In terms of what was gained, I think the main thing that was gained was an opportunity at the time uh, a lot of which was has been frittered away, in my opinion. Um, uh, we certainly have uh, had more opportunities to interact among the races, but I'm very discouraged today to sit here and feel like things are, particularly the schools are resegregating and the powers that be are allowing that, not only allowing it to happen, but facilitating it. And um, um, so I, it's not ending on a hopeful note for me as to, as to how I see it, but the, the main thing that was gained was the opportunity. And for those who stepped through that door and took advantage of it, um, they, they have gained from that, but I, 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 I guess like any human endeavor, the, you're, you know, you're going to come up short of where you want to be. And I just feel like as a society, we've come up real short on uh, taking advantage of that opportunity that's been put before us. Thanks for that, Lee. As a historian, there's so many missed moments in our uh, timeline of existence. And yes, I, I agree with you. There are times that we could just go so much further in a, in a wonderful uh, direction to create outcomes that are um, inclusive and, and elevating of, of all of us. And there's just 
these missed moments. So I appreciate you uh, articulating that point. Uh, Mayor Gorham, uh, what was gained and what was lost? If it's possible to gain something from integration, um, one of the things that my father told me as I was in high school that I needed to prepare myself for my future. And my father was a barber. And he said, son, I'll have to work every day of my life because I won't have anything but social security. You need to go into a profession that's going to provide you with a retirement along with social security. The majority of the members of my family, or a lot of the members of my family, were teachers. So if I gained anything from that experience, I had an opportunity to see the good and the bad in the teachers that, that I work with. I had an opportunity to see how children were treated and it gave me the mindset that if I become a teacher I want to make some corrections of some of these bad things that I've seen. I was a school bus driver so I had an opportunity to work with elementary kids. At that point I determined I didn't want to be a high school teacher I wanted to be an elementary school teacher because the kids that I drove on that bus didn't see integration the way grown folks saw it. So that gave me an opportunity to realize and to, and to develop the mindset that these kids are taught how to hate. And because I developed that mindset, I determined that when I become a classroom teacher, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen in my classroom. And I'm going to make sure that there's some groundwork laid so that those kids who leave my class will continue to live that quality and uh, of life and be productive citizens and not citizens who are, who are going to do anything in an unjust manner. So I did gain some things. It helped me with my career. What do we lose? Often today you hear people say that it takes a village to raise a child. During desegregation, we lost a village. I go back to the love that was in the black community and in the, the black school. When I left home, I was going home to get that education. Teachers were placed on a pedestal in the black community. They had more power than anybody except mama and daddy. And those teachers, as many have said, knew you. They knew your parents. And they didn't always have to say, I'm going to tell you your mom, I'm going to tell your daddy. They could just look at you. <laughs> that same look that mom and daddy would get. So you knew that you needed to do what needed to be done to be successful. And you could sense, children can tell if you care. Now, like Dr. White said before she left, didn't always go along. I didn't always go along with my mom and dad said it, but I knew they loved me. So I think the biggest loss for me was the sense of community, that village, that real village. I appreciate that. You said something that uh, truly resonates with me as well in my work with uh, youth. That, that is the absolute truth. They, they, they know. And they'll tell you if you you push for them. Even if they mess them around, jump around, acting crazy, they, they'll say, I know you love them. If you give them, give them an opportunity, they, they'll share it with you. I appreciate you acknowledging that. <coughs> Miss Fouché, what was gained and what was lost? Well, I feel like there was love gained because I learned that we all were the same. 
even though we had different skin colors, different language, we still were the same. And even though I went through the fighting, the name calling, they all were not that way. It starts in the home. And you could tell that some kids, it was the parents that they told them, you call them this or you do this, you know, they'll be afraid of you. But then you had some that were, when you would get them to the side, they wanted to be your friend. They wanted to go home with you, <laughs> you know. So I felt like I gained a, a little respect, even though I would call spook. And as I grew older and found out my father was part white. And I was like, for real? You know, seeing his aunts, they look white. They didn't look like me. But I found out we had that togetherness. We 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 could have it. And I experienced it as I became an adult. Some of my friends, I just, I mean, they're better to me, the white ones, than my own color. You can have that discrimination between your own color. It's like he said, just because you're light, you know, they didn't like you. Or if you were darker, they didn't like you. And this went on in the schools because you had the light-skinned teachers that favored the light-skinned students. And the darker-skinned students had to sit in the back of the classroom. This is before it was, you know, segregated. But, you know, you also miss that family, the teachers being all your same color and they were there for you. They would help you. If you were cutting up, your parents knew about it. You knew about that. <laughs> so, you know, and that made the teachers meet with the parents sit down and conversate with them, and then you know where your child was. When they felt like, okay, I'm gonna play in school, I'm gonna play hooky, or I'm not gonna do this, and I'm not gonna do that, but you got that, that one teacher that sees the potential in a child and reaches out to the parents, and then you all come together and you get them out. And you know who that is. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, and it's it, about you, mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is about me. It was part of me instilling that in you guys to know there is no difference, and you can be and do just as you can be president if you want to. You know, you just gotta do it. And I just, that's what I gained and what I lost was like I said, the 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 teachers, the one on one on one basis. I feel like if I had that, I probably would have been higher than what I was. But I am here now. <laughs> I love Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to highlight really quickly a, a through line that's that's been uh very present in this discussion that I am so um, appreciative of everyone having uh, the ability to process. The Black experience was way more centered on community and a support system and an appreciation for the love you could get within because what the world was telling you was not anything attached to love so um i want to show appreciation for all of you really kind of accepting that and understanding that without any pushback or disruption to that notion because it's it's a fact and, and it, i know it because i come from a black community and i know my mother's experience and it's a through line it's this always this this mentioning this affinity for the community that uplifted and supported especially during times like that. Um, Bob, tell, tell us. Oh, sorry. I gotta go. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, well, can you go right now? Can you say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot. Okay. Yeah.
So what was gained, what was lost, and then we'll get to Bob, and then we'll get out of here. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, what I believe was lost was, it's a, was the history. A lot of history uh, was lost over time. And when I think about Blacks teaching Blacks about Black history, there was never any hate in that teaching. And see where we are today was some don't even want to have a conversation about black history. But when we were taught black history, it was never in a hate with it. Mm -hmm. It was just knowledge of understanding what our foreparents went through and how we got here. And then with a sense of thanksgiving uh, that we made it to where we are. So what was gained is, uh, I believe, some knowledge of who we are. Uh, I think I learned who I was um, during my high school years, despite of how others thought of me. I was I was sure who I was as a black man, as a young black man, and, um, unapologetic about that. Uh, so I gained that, and that has helped me uh, in allowing me some of my life. I think that's why I'm so passionate now with kids. To make sure they understand who they are uh, and take advantage of the opportunities that are available to them. Because oftentimes we were not told about the opportunities that were available to us. I was fortunate enough to go to college from high school, but a guidance council didn't help me. It was other blacks in our community that helped my parents to understand what they needed to do to help me get in, get in college. That didn't come from my school. Um, so that's that's where that's at. And, and, but I think it's important nowadays because we're seeing the same trend now. There's a lot of smart black kids in our school systems today. If they end up in college, you might not get it from a counselor. You go to any graduation at the three high schools in Rockingham County, you'll see millions of dollars given away in scholarships. But you won't send it to a lot of people who look like me walk across that stage getting those scholarships. That's a problem. That's a major problem still to this day. Um, so there's been a lot to learn, a lot to learn. And those of us who came through that, we know what to look for now. Um, we have a community that have a, a male Gorham now, who's been a principal, who's a school teacher, bus driver, all of his experiences, he's always been willing to share that. We need those in our community. So I appreciate you having this tonight. It causes us to reflect and remember back, but uh, it's been great. Uh, first, I'm, I'm going to just say, if, this, if, if, if desegregation of the schools had been successful, that was 55 years ago, we wouldn't have the circumstances that we have today. So there's no way it can be looked upon as a successful something to have happened. We wouldn't have still what we have today. We would have learned a lot more from it, and we would have reconciled a lot better from it. We would have much more naturally integrated neighborhoods now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have none of that. We have not, if you look at, if you look at, how we operate. We've not gained enough from the fact that 55 years ago, we were forced to start going to school together. Um, and I think that's, I think that's, I think that's self-evident. Um, when you um, resentfully dictate how to accomplish something that you're just told to accomplish and you don't do it with love and care for the people that are, that should be the beneficiaries of it. How do you accomplish anything other than building resentment on both sides of the aisle? I'll say, I'll say it that way. Um, in so many situations, and in Loretha's situation, and it sounds like it's in these other situations too, 
um, everybody was disrupted. Um, Aretha went to Grimsley. I knew Grimsley kids that were pulled out of Grimsley, sent to Smith, maybe sent to Dudley. They didn't want that to happen, but it happened. There was all of this, um, um, I don't want to say chaos, but there was, but the way it was done was so, found so much resentment amongst kids and parents alike. My situation just happened to be different. And if every situation had been like my situation, who knows? But my situation, what I can say is from the white student perspective, nothing was lost. From the white student perspective, we lost no resources, we lost no, it, uh, we, we lost no security, we lost, we lost nothing. And we gained, we gained interaction with a new group of talented people that contributed to the life of the school in a lot of different ways. And we gained that experience without losing anything. And I think that, I wish that one of my black classmates were here to talk about it from their perspective. There very well might have been a sense of loss of community. Though I think in my situation too, we added bus stops. We didn't change bus routes. We just added bus stops. Um, I think in my situation too, there was more community, there was more integrated community to begin with. And so it was less unfamiliar for people to be in a now integrated school system. They just stopped going to those other schools. Everybody started going to our schools. And so uh, in my specific situation, I think a lot was gained. I don't know what was lost in the, in the, in the eyes of the black students. Um, um, Kenneth commented about college. I can say that out of my high school, I would say that at least the same percentage of black kids went on to college as white kids. Because we're all together doing all the same things with all the same support systems and there wasn't resentment of any of that within the school. But I also have to say that I think my situation was very unique. Yeah, I think the uniqueness applies and I I truly appreciate um, each of you sharing this this personal um, perspective that is so necessary to again paint a fuller picture. Uh, I'm grateful for this, uh, Mayor Gorham, my mother, Loretta. I get to say her name, uh, Bob. I appreciate you, Lee. Thanks a lot, Ricky. Glad you could come in here and uh, fill Dr. White's seat. Um, and thank you so much, David, for he and I talked about this months ago, and there's nothing like when things come together, right? So I'm um, glad to have done this. And as you probably all can tell, there's a lot more conversation that can and should be had. So I'm hopeful that we can come back and revisit this in the not too distant future and uh, just keep on having these meaningful interactions and we save it for posterity that others can see that we were conscious of the times we were living in and we had something to say.